Welcome, everyone. We are in Isaiah chapter 21. As Isaiah continues going through the things that are going to happen in the day of the Lord, and of course the central uh, thing that um, is exciting for us is the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. But um, there are lots of things that he's going to deal with when he comes back. And Isaiah begins listing burdens, the burden of Babylon, the burden of Moab, the burden of Damascus, um, and so on. And here in uh, also the burden of Egypt. And here in uh, Isaiah 21, it's the burden of the desert of the sea. And as the whirlwinds which pass through the wilderness in the land of the south, so they come from the terrible land. A grievous vision is shown unto me for one who is treacherous, another deals treacherously. And for one destroyer, another destroyer. Rise up Elam, besiege Media, all the sighing thereof I have made to cease. What is the burden of the desert of the sea? Well, we know that in prophetic language, the sea represents um, lost humanity, humanity that is not in covenant with God. And uh, we know that the sand of the seashore represents legalistic individuals like the legalistic Jews um, who they're not uh, like the stars of the sky. In other words, they haven't been born again with eternal life, but they are in a covenant with God, and the covenant has mostly natural benefits for them. And so uh, they're trying to get God or use God to get what they want. And and God um, will sometimes go along with this. Remember, that's how Jacob started out. He said that if God would um, protect him, take him where he was going, bring him home again safely, that uh, he would give God 10% of everything that God gave him. A, a pretty good deal for Jacob. And there's a lot of Christians today that are on the 10% commitment level. And... Um, don't realize that under the new covenant, God really isn't after our money. He's after us. And if we commit ourselves totally to the Lord, the Holy Spirit will show us what to do, what God wants us to do with, his, with our money. And um, the entire church age is typed in Scripture as the desert. It's, it's not the promised land, the fullness of the promised land, the lifting of the curse. That happens after the day of the Lord, and Isaiah describes it. And so um, the church in Revelation as, is described as a woman in the wilderness being uh, persecuted by the devil, but the, God sends her food just like the Israelites received manna. God puts ministry to give the word of God, but the devil comes after her and um, with a river like a flood. The devil is offering the prosperity of this world but as long as the woman remains in the wilderness, the desert is dry enough to soak it all up and she won't get washed away with the prosperity of the things of this world. As long as the woman, as long as the two churches in the wilderness, we need to depend on God each day, just like the children of Israel did for their manna, for water from the rock. Um, they, they needed his leading by the pillar of cloud, by the, by the pillar of fire. Because they were going through a wilderness where there was no way. But he is the way. So now, in the events leading up to and uh, immediately after Jesus coming back, um, the wilderness walk of the church, of the people of God, is supposed to come to an end. His, his people are supposed to be in Mount Zion. Mount Zion is where he's restored everything, even lifting the curse. Because the only place where there's no curse right now is in the life of Christ. And at the second coming, not only will we see Jesus physically, but the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out in a much stronger portion. What we've had up until now, the Apostle Paul called the down payment or the earnest of our inheritance. But we're talking about the fullness of our inheritance in Christ, the fullness of the Spirit being operating in and through God's people. And that is going to be 
literally so amazing and so indescribable that the prophets took it from different angles, diff different viewpoints, different pictures, and many of them overlapping, as is also the case in the book of Revelation. And so the burden of the desert of the sea means that um, there's people that have come out of the sea uh, into a desert, but they never got to the promised land. They, they, they never made it into uh, where you can grow anything uh, that would bear good fruit. And um, one example of people coming out of paganism and coming into a desert of the sea where there's no um, fruit of the Holy Spirit um, is certain sects of legalistic Christianity, uh, certain types of, of Jews, uh, some over in national Israel right now that don't want to work and are just uh, living off the government and, and waiting for the Messiah to return. But they, they, they don't like the name of Jesus. And uh, another group that would fit this is Islam because th they don't believe in pagan gods anymore. They don't believe in idols, but they have a, a, a warped concept and um, the, the fruit isn't very good. And, and the attitude isn't very good. Now, now, God looks at people everywhere and looks at the heart, and we can't judge anyone's heart. And uh, there are certainly well-intentioned people that want to do what's right in many places around the world uh, where their groups as a whole aren't really given good fruit. But that doesn't mean that there can't be extraordinary individuals and we've seen this many many places and god sees it too but um as the whirlwinds which pass through the wilderness in the land of the south so they come from the terrible land now whirlwinds in scripture almost always have to do with the judgment of god and um the terrible land is where there's no good fruit and, and God begins to allow the consequences of what has been planted uh, to come back and uh, affect the people. Because sooner or later, everyone has to reap what they've sown. And if they're, if they're not sowing the life of Christ, if they're not, they won't reap the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And there's 17 very nasty things that are the fruit of the flesh, and uh, that's what they're liable to reap. And so this is a grievous vision is shown unto me, unto Isaiah. For one who is treacherous, another who deals treacherously. And so who, who's been the most treacherous one that we can think of in this whole history of humankind? It's the devil. And he has a whole kingdom, in fact, the whole series of kingdoms that all fight against one another, and they're all full of treacherous people. And so now he's going to get kicked out of the heavenly realm, and he's got to come down and try and put order into his diverse kingdoms. I mean, look at all that's out there that we could attribute to the devil and just think in your mind. I don't want to name too many uh, groups and peoples and things because th the idea of this message isn't to condemn. It's to encourage people to follow their heart and seek the truth and seek the light and, um, and, and, and leave the darkness behind. And there's other people that generate conspiracy theories, and they see darkness everywhere. They see nothing but darkness. And it's like someone trying to um, somehow take a broom and chase the darkness out of their house instead of turning on the light. And the only way we'll ever get rid of the darkness is if we allow the light of Jesus Christ to shine from inside our hearts and let him deal with any darkness that's still inside of us so that he can turn us into a blessing to others. So in other words, you got people that are treacherous. Um, there's going to be people even more treacherous. Uh, the devil thinks he's the most treacherous person. Uh, well, um, Willie tries. Willie gets kicks out, kicked out of the of the spiritual realm, and uh, what he's doing actually gets exposed here on earth, and and uh, everyone will be able to see how treacherous he is and how treacherous his people are, and how he's trying to put order. And for one destroyer, another destroyer. The, the devil loves to kill and destroy. 
he, he's not creative. He can't make anything that's that's good or lasting or eternally worthwhile. Anything that's good comes from God. If, if the devil wants to use anything from good that's good, he has to borrow it from God. He, there is no other source of good, and that's true for all of his minions. And so um, if all you want to do is destroy and um, deal treacherously, well, how about a whole kingdom full of people living in darkness, and they're going to consume one another. That's what the book of Isaiah and other prophecies in the Bible say from all different angles, angles over and over and over. Evil will turn on itself. Rise up, Elam, besiege Media. All the sighing thereof I have made to cease. Elam means the secret or unseen realm. And Media, the center of the earth. And the center of the earth, of course, is where men are trying to make their own covenants with God. And, and the, uh, one of the covenants that men love to make with God, and God will take it as a starting point, is the 10% covenant that Jacob liked so much. And um, that's, that's spread all over. And God will take that as a starting point, but it can't be the ending point. And, and God likes to take his people through the wilderness, but um, the only way for God's people to get through the wilderness is by the grace of God. And if we come to the end of the age of grace and Jesus comes back and wants us all in the promised land instead of in the wilderness, wandering around in our own good intentions, well, whoever's still left out in the wilderness is going to be in for a really rough time. But there's hope. Verse 3, therefore my loins are filled with pain. What's pain for? Why does God even allow pain? Pain is to show us that we're doing something that if we don't quit doing it, we're going to get burnt up. We're going to get destroyed. We're, go we're going to lose something important. Pangs have taken hold of me as the pangs of a woman that travails. And, and God's going to bring forth a new nation, Isaiah says later, in a day. And it's going to take some birth pangs. And it's going to come out of the natural realm. And so... Um, there's a lot of people that are using God's name or, or they have a concept of God that they've made uh, God in the image, remade God in the image of man instead of uh, allowing themselves to be remade in, in the image of God. And these people are all out in the desert, the desert of the sea. And um, it's going to get really hard to survive there if uh, God has moved on and uh, these people didn't move with him. I was bowed down at the hearing of it. I was dismayed at the seeing of it. Yeah, Isaiah's heart went out to these people. My heart panted. The horror frightened me. The night of my pleasure has turned into fear unto me. It's, it's one thing for God's people to be going through the wilderness and you've got the pillar of cloud and you've got the pillar of of fire, and you've got God's grace and miraculous provision. But what if you're out in the wilderness and you've got your theology twisted and your covenant with God is twisted, didn't really come from him, and all of a sudden, um, like the five foolish virgins, your, your lamp starts running out of oil and you can't find any more oil. There's no more grace. There's no more anointing. Because you didn't move at the right time. Uh, verse 5. Prepare the table. Watch in the watchtower. Eat, drink, arise, you, pre you princes, and anoint the shield. For thus hath the Lord said unto me, Go set a watchman who shall declare what he sees. God's watchmen in this time according to Scripture, are clothed in sackcloth. That is, they're clothed in repentance. And we've already seen what happened with the burden of Damascus where they don't believe in repentance. And that's going to be turned into a heap of ruins and never be, um, never amount to anything. And um, now, this isn't just any watchman. He's telling Isaiah, who's one of his key prophets, and any of God's prophets are watchmen, and they call people to repentance when things aren't right. Prepare the table. What kind of table? What are we going to eat? Watch in the watchtower. Eat, drink, arise, ye princes. Anoint the shield. 
uh, they, they're going to need some defenses. And uh, the shield, according to Apostle Paul, in the letter to the Ephesians, is of faith. And faith means depending on God. And uh, that's all linked to the anointing and to being in a relationship with him. And so um, we got this um, watchman. God has still placed true watchmen. Said a watchman who shall declare what he sees. And he saw a chariot with a couple of horsemen, a chariot of asses, donkeys, and a chariot of camels. Then he looked with more diligence, and he cried, A lion upon the watchman. My Lord, I stand continually all the day and all night long upon my watchtower, and behold, this chariot of men comes with a couple of horsemen. And afterwards he spoke and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and all the graven images of her gods he has broken unto the ground. Well, we know Babylon has to do with false religion, with false spirits behind it. We also know that the devil is roaming as a lion to see whom he may devour. And so the watchman sees a chariot, of men. In other words, humanism. A chariot is a symbol of religious institutions, religious machine, machinery, uh, man making uh, something work to get accomplish his purposes and uh, for his defense. And God's armies in the scripture, in the books of Moses, um, were not to trust in horses. They were not to trust in chariots because when they were in communion with God, God delivered them from the iron chariots of their enemies. And they didn't need chariots and they didn't need horses. And um, when the kings of Israel got away from that, it didn't go well with them. And so a chariot of asses, donkeys, Linked to the flesh. In other words, this chariot doesn't operate in the spirit. It operates in the flesh. And uh, a chariot of camels. Uh, if, if, God, uh, if God isn't there to lead us and to provide for us, well, maybe we can trust in camels and somehow get our chariot across the wilderness and uh, into where we need to go. But... I've never heard of chariots being pulled by camels. I don't think it's going to work very good. And in the middle of all this, the watchman cries, a lion upon the watchman. In other words, the devil's behind all this. He's he's still fooling everybody. And uh, he, he's got them in a false sense of security. He's thinking they can set a table where they are. They can eat and drink. And, um, and God's saying, well, at least put a watchman, a watchman who's going to um, declare what he sees. Ezekiel looks at the same situation from a different angle and says that when the watchman sees the enemy coming, if he doesn't sound the alarm, the blood of those that are lost are on him. But if he sounds the alarm and nobody pays attention and they're lost, then they're responsible for themselves. Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and all the graven images of her gods he has broken into the ground. So all of these other gods, and we still have um, churches literally full of images, but we also have churches that worship their money, their, their position, their power, their prestige, their positions, their society. We have churches today that are like the church of the Laodiceans in Revelation chapter 3, the end of chapter 3, where... They have absolutely everything. But the only thing they don't have is the Lord. He's standing outside knocking to see if they'll let him back in. And he's not going to stand outside the church of the Laodiceans forever because he's coming back in power and force with all of his saints. And uh, in the second coming, they're not going to fool around. They're not going to tolerate misrepresentation 
of God by people that are supposed to be in the ministry. Verse 10, O oh, my harvest and the people of my threshing floor. That's how the day of the Lord is described. It's a harvest. It's a threshing floor. First removing the, the tares from among the wheat, then removing the chaff from the wheat, and uh, getting everything sorted out. And there's all different kinds of things that get harvested. And anything that's of value, um, the Lord harvests. And everything that is not of value to him, that doesn't produce the fruit that he's looking for, goes up in smoke. O oh, my harvest and the people of my threshing floor, that which I have heard of the Lord of the hosts, the God of Israel, I have declared unto you. So Isaiah has warned us. He's a true watchman. He said, look, this is what's coming. Um, people are going to be stuck out in the desert, trusting in humanism, trusting in the flesh, uh, trying to come up with some hairbane screen, uh, uh, somehow using some camels, and get their chariot across the desert when, when God's not doing that anymore. The burden of Duma. Duma means silence. He calls to me out of Seir. Seir is means rough and hairy, and the Bible flat out says Seir is Edom. In other words, it's the kingdom of Esau, and Esau is typical of making your own kingdom. Those that would make their own kingdom, even using the name of the Lord. The burden of Duma, and he calls out to me, he calls to me out of Seir, watchman, what of the night? What of this night? Watchman, what of this night? It isn't just any night. It's this night. Well, the night leading into the day of the Lord, and the day in Scripture always begins with the night. The evening and the morning were the first day, and so on and so forth. And so Isaiah says that this day of the Lord begins with darkness and with gross darkness over the peoples, especially the peoples that have built their own kingdoms because they're not even in God's kingdom. And so... Um, What's this watchman doing in the middle of the night out of Seir, Mount Esau? The watchman said, the morning comes and then the night. If you will inquire, inquire ye, return and come. The watchman doesn't see anything. He just sees the night comes, the morning comes, and uh, I'm here on watch, and no big deal. But... Isaiah, the true watchman of the Lord, he saw humanism. He saw people struggling in the desert in the flesh. He saw them trying to hitch camels to their chariot to get their religious machinery to some semblance of safety. He saw the lion on the watch. Hmm. Verse 13 of Isaiah 21. The burden upon Arabia. In the forest ye shall pass the night in Arabia, O ye walkers of Denadim. Well, Arabia means the desert. And um, in the forest means they're not out of the woods. In the forest, in those deserts, it's stickers, thorns, scraggly. It's really difficult to move through and full of Nasty wild beasts. Walkers of Denadim means uh, inhabitants of the desert. The inhabitants of the desert are not the inhabitants of the promised land. The inhabitants of the desert are still trying to be in the age of grace and the age of the church when God has moved on. Now it's the age of the kingdom. Uh, verse 14, go, go ye out to meet them, bringing water for, for the thirsty. O inhabitants of the land of Tema, succor those who are fleeing with your bread. Tema means those that are burnt by the sun out in the desert. And uh, this is so bad, that those that are left in the desert, still trying to do the church when, when God's doing the kingdom. Um. When uh, Moab went down, the ones fleeing Moab at least could make it out of there. And uh, the true people of God were, were told to um, told that God was going to cut off the ones that were really bad and nasty and that the rest that were refugees we were supposed to take in and help. 
But this is such a bad situation here that they can't even make it to us. If they're going to be saved, we have to we have to go out and meet them with water, or they're going to die of thirst on the way. Verse 15, for they flee from the presence of the sword, from the presence of the drawn sword, from the presence of the bent bow, and from the presence of the grievousness of the battle. God's going to bring things together in a battle. It's a it's there's liable to be a literal battle here that will be a symbol of it, but the real battle is spiritual, and everyone on the planet is going to be brought, scripture says, to the valley of decision. And there's going to be no more possibility of being lukewarm. You're either for God or against him. And there's going to be people fleeing out of that battle, trying to get somewhere safe. And um, if they genuinely are seeking the Lord, well, our orders are to go out and meet them with water. The water of the word of God, which is the only thing that will save them. And the bread of life, which is Jesus Christ. For thus has the Lord said unto me, Within a year, according to the years of a hireling, all the glory of Keter shall be undone. Keter means the powerful. All of these people that have been powerful, lording themselves over the others and controlling others, and we've seen this in other pictures. And this is, the, the time frame is getting um, closer and closer. When, when Moab goes down, Isaiah prophesies, then in three years there won't be anything left of Moab. And... Um, I'm wondering three years from, from now what's going to be left of Moab, really. But here, in Moab is those who would rather have a spiritual director or uh, someone uh, that's covering or controlling them instead of a personal relationship with God. And um, here, within a year, now, now it's not three years anymore, within a year... Um, According to the years of a hireling, in other words, somebody that's working hard all day long and counting the days, all the glory of Kedar shall be undone. These people that are lording it over others. And uh, I think this definitely applies to the world of Islam, which means submission. But there's others that have gotten themselves in the same boat, pushing the same submission from other angles and, and not joining the people to God in submission to him so that they can be led by the Holy Spirit and brought to maturity in Christ so that they can produce good fruit because what, what God is interested, what Jesus is interested when, in when he returns is the fruit. In fact, he even says, ye shall know them by their fruits. Mm, verse 17, last verse in Isaiah 21, and the residue of the number of valiant archers, sons of Kedar, shall be diminished for the Lord God of Israel has spoken it. Isaiah 22, the burden of the valley of the vision. We've just seen the burden of the desert of the sea, not the valley of the vision. What's the valley of the vision? What ails thee now that thou art completely gone up to the housetops? That thou art full of tumults, a tumultuous city, a joyous city. Thy dead are not slain with the sword nor slain in battle. All thy princes together fled from the bow. They were bound all that were found in thee were bound together. The others fled far away. Well, there's some that are bound together in group think. They can't think individually. They've been conditioned because they think they're in a place of safety. But um, this valley where this final battle is going to occur is called the Valley of Armageddon. And it's not a safe place. They fled from the bow. They, they, they didn't want to fight. Um, their dead haven't been slain with a sword nor slain in battle, yet they're, they're protecting themselves at all costs. All that were found in thee were bound together. The others fled far away. Well, who's bound together and who fled far away? Therefore I said, leave me, I will weep bitterly. Do not labor to comfort me of the destruction of the daughter of my people. 
Who's the daughter? Obviously, it's talking about a congregation, a sub-congregation. And um, for a day of trouble and of treading down and of wearing down by the Lord God of the hosts is sent in the valley of the vision to break down the wall and give a cry unto the mountain. Well, when God doesn't like the fruit, he breaks down the wall of protection. And um, anyone among God's people that's producing good fruit has absolutely nothing to fear in the day of the Lord. They'll be covered by God. But here it mentions Elam again. Also, Elam bore the quiver of, in the chariot of men and of horsemen, and Kerr uncovered the shield. And it came to pass that thy choicest valleys were full of chariots, and the soldiers set themselves in array at the gate. Now again, Elam, this unseen world. The unseen world, or unseen realm, probably be better description, is where a huge spiritual conflict has been raging. And Satan's going to lose his conflict. And he's going to be cast down to the earth. And the armies of heaven are going to come down after him. And um, God's people here on the earth, and Jesus is going to come back with his chosen people. And we're going to be caught up to meet him in the air and follow him down. It's going to be an amazing thing. But a lot of people are going to be caught in the valley of the vision. Now, the valley of the vision, the valley in earlier scriptures and in later scriptures has to do with decision, the valley of decision. And we see that some already fled far away and others are sitting there band together with their group think. And um, a day of trouble like nobody's ever seen before is coming. And anyone that isn't secure in God is in a lot of trouble. And it came to pass, verse 7 of Isaiah 22, that thy choicest valleys were full of chariots, and the soldiers set themselves in array at the gates. And he discovered the covering of Judah, and thou didst look in that day to the house of weapons of the forest. You remember the palace of David and Solomon was called the house of the forest of Lebanon. And that's where they hung the gold shields that they captured from the enemies. And then uh, when Solomon's son started losing it, he lost the gold shields and had to that symbolize the nature of God, that's our protection, and had to replace it with bronze or brass shields that symbolized the, the judgmentalness of man or judgment. You have seen, also seen the breaches of the city of David, that they are multiplied, and you gathered together the waters of the lower pool. In other words, When this unseen realm gets revealed, Satan's going to get thrown out of it with his principalities and powers down here to make his last stand. And he's going to look for any breaches among the people of God. And uh, those that aren't protected by the righteousness of Christ, if, if they don't have gold shields, if they only have brass shields of self-righteousness, um, there's going to be breaches in the house of David. And one of the reasons that God has allowed the devil to continue for 6,000 years, is that if we have any weaknesses, the devil is going to find them. And uh, that's to our advantage, so that we can get these things dealt with by God before it's too late. And ye numbered the houses of Jerusalem, and ye have broken down houses to fortify the wall. When God builds things, he doesn't tear it down afterwards. The Jerusalem here below has got serious problems. The Jerusalem here below is also known as Sodom and Egypt and where our Lord was crucified. The Jerusalem from above, the heavenly Jerusalem, that's where Jesus has his throne, and it says that he ascended high, far above all heavens, and Ezekiel saw his throne above the heavens. And um, the Jerusalem from above, you're never going to have to destroy houses to fortify the wall. 
That's talking about people that are using God's name down here below, but they've been controlling others. They haven't listened to the watchmen. They've been invaded by humanism. They're operating in the flesh. And, and, uh, and now, desperately, they want to hitch their chariots to unclean camels and see if they can get out of the wilderness. You have also made a moat between the two walls with the water of the old pool, but you have not looked unto the maker thereof, nor had respect unto him that fashioned it long ago. They've been trying to raise fish like the burden of Egypt in pools of water that doesn't flow, of water that doesn't come from God, of water that they've concocted together, and now they're going to take their pools and try and make it into a moat and see if they can defend themselves. Therefore the Lord God of the hosts did call in this day unto weeping and to mourning and to baldness and to girding with sacrifice. The same thing as the prophet Joel is asking the people to do, everyone to repent. The same thing that happens in Revelation 10 and 11. And behold, joy and gladness, slaying oxen and killing sheep, eating flesh and drinking wine, while they say, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. When the ancient world was destroyed, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage up until the day when God put Noah in the ark with his family and sealed the door. And then the flood swept them all away. The apostle Paul quotes this phrase in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, somewhere around verse 30 or 32, somewhere in there. And uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is the great chapter in the Bible about the first resurrection and about the second coming and how we'll be resurrected and transformed at the sound of the last trumpet, the seventh trumpet. In other words, this coincides with Revelation chapter 11 towards the end. When all the kingdoms of this world come down and God's kingdom comes up over the top and now he's got his kingdom and he's taken the authority of all the other kingdoms. And so what are they doing? Joy and gladness, slaying oxen and killing sheep. They're making religious sacrifices, religious ritual like you can't believe. Eating flesh and drinking wine while they say, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. And Paul relates this phrase to those that don't believe in resurrection. In other words, if you think that all you've got is this present life, well then why not eat and drink for tomorrow we die? And that's it. The Sadducees did not believe in life after death. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in spirits. So how could they believe in the Holy Spirit? The Pharisees at least believed in life after death and in resurrection. And eventually, a number of Pharisees were converted after a lot of initial resistance. But the Sadducees, there's no evidence that they ever converted, and they had held the real power, and they were the high priests, and um, their um, total and utter spiritual blindness caused Jerusalem and the temple to be destroyed within just a few years after they made their last attempt to kill the Apostle Paul. It came suddenly after that. Paul was on his way to Rome. Rome was in a bunch of trouble. And right in there, not too long after, uh, Jerusalem was besieged. And that was the end of everyone that tried to take refuge in the temple or in the city behind the walls of Jerusalem. And that is a type and shadow, according to Jesus, in Matthew chapter 24, of what's going to happen in the end of the age of grace, which we're in right now. And the age of, age of grace has a possibility that can end differently. Because if God's people are moved by the Spirit, the only people that were saved out of the destruction of Jerusalem were those that were led by the Holy Spirit to leave while there was still time. I've run into a lot of theologians in my life 
who didn't believe in the Bible stories, didn't believe in the miracles, uh, thought the book of Isaiah was really written by somebody after, a long time after, and that it was writing it as history instead of prophecy. Um, except for the, those people got messed up when the Dead Sea Scrolls turned out to be accurate on the book of Isaiah. And then um, people that don't believe in the resurrection, well, that's a huge theological problem. Paul, Paul says, if we don't believe in the resurrection, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then our faith is in vain. People that don't believe in the resurrection tend not to believe in anything else. They may not believe in the incarnation. They may not believe in hell or heaven. If you want to do an interesting experience sometime, take your Strong's Concordance and look up what he says about the cherubim, the angels, the powerful angels around God's throne. He says, mythical imaginary beings. And if and if you try and, and pin him down on other references, I get the idea that um, he does not have a firm, solid conviction that there's a real literal hell or a real literal heaven. I get the feeling that he's thinking, let's eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we die. A modern Sadducee and oodles of Christians take their definition of key theological terminology, especially spiritual, scriptural names, from Dr. Strom, who has a penchant for getting things not just a little bit off, but a lot of places where he gets it 180 degrees off. Like when he says that the name of David's chief scribe is vanity or nothing, and it's supposed to be diligent, and so on. His numbering system is a genius. His Greek scholarship isn't too bad. But his Hebrew scholarship, and particularly the names, is absolutely atrocious. And the mistakes are horrendous. See, the natural man doesn't just get things a little bit off. The natural man makes wrong assumptions and then gets it totally 180 degrees opposed, being off. And ends up thinking there is no resurrection. Those that don't think there's a resurrection don't think there's a second coming. The, the theologians, theologians that I've argued with that don't think there's a resurrection, none of them believes in the second coming. They think I am antiquated, quaint, um, uh, not modern, not progressive enough. Believing what they think are fairy tales. Well, everybody's going to find out what this is like. And if you wait too long, it'll be too late. You don't have to understand everything. You don't even have to understand much about prophecy. All you need to understand is that if we live in a close relationship with the Lord and make sure our hearts are clean and only a close relationship with the Lord and the presence of the Holy Spirit as we yield to it can ensure us having clean hearts, that's the only way to survive what's coming. Everything else is going to go down. You also made a moat between the two walls with the water of the old pool, but you have not looked unto the maker thereof, nor had respect unto him that fashioned it long ago. Therefore the Lord God of the host did call in this day into weeping and to mourning and to baldness. Baldness means no glory. No glory for man. Instead of humanism, hatching our chariots to man and to girding with sackcloth. That means repentance. And in order to fully repent, that requires help from God. And behold, joy and gladness and slaying oxen and killing sheep, eating flesh and drinking wine, while they say, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. This was revealed in my ears by the Lord of the hosts, that, that surely this iniquity shall not be purged from you until you die, saith the Lord of the hosts. There is no way for God to bless the wicked unless they repent. 
And if we repent, it means the end of what Scripture calls the old man, the old nature. Our inheritance from Adam the first, so that the life of Jesus, the second Adam. There's only two men in history that were born innocent and free. One was Adam the first, and he squandered that going against what God told him. Only one thing he wasn't supposed to do, and he went out and did it. With his eyes open. His wife was fooled, but he wasn't. And Jesus. And Jesus is born clean, free, even though he's born of a woman. And he's the one that provided the way out for all of us. Cost him his life. Verse 15, Thus saith the Lord God of the hosts, Go, get thee under this treasurer, even unto Shebna, which is over the house. And say, Shebna means scribe. What hast thou here? Of whom hast thou here that thou hast hewed thee out a sepulcher here as he hews himself out a sepulcher on a high place or that graves a habitation for himself in a rock? If you think, let's eat and drink now for tomorrow we die, there is no life hereafter then you're going to leave a monument. These people that have amassed tremendous wealth, what do they leave? A foundation, a humanitarian, uh, quote, quote, foundation. A big monument. Hmm? That's all they can think of. Verse 17, Behold, the Lord will carry thee away in a hard captivity and will surely cover Thy face. Cover thy face means that's it. You're going to die in the hard captivity. Where is that? Sheol, Hades, where the souls of the dead are waiting final judgment. That is, souls of the dead that don't belong to Jesus. Because when he died, he went down there and took the keys and ascended on high, led captivity captive. And now those who belong to Jesus are described in the book of Revelation, chapter 6, as souls under the heavenly altar. They're under the blood, under the life of Jesus Christ, waiting for God to intervene here upon the earth. Verse 18, He will surely violently turn and toss thee like a ball into a large country. There thou shalt die, and there the chariots of thy glory shall come to an end, the shame of the house of thy Lord. Who's their Lord? The God of this world. It's all going to come to an end. They're going to get tossed wherever God decides to toss them. And that's where they're going to come to their end. And we know from other prophecy that they're going to come to their end upon the mountains of Israel. And the mountains in Israel start out in Scripture as the eternal hills. The, the foundational values and precepts of the world that God created that's based on truth and leads to eternal life instead of the world that Satan founded that's based on lies and leads to eternal death. Verse 19, and I will drive thee from thy place, and he shall pull thee down from thy state. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my slave Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. And I will clothe him with thy robe and strengthen him with thy girdle, and I will commit thy government into his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judea. There's going to be a change of government. The prince of this world is going to get dethroned. He's going to get taken off into a hard captivity. He's going to be locked up where he used to hold his own empire of death. Jesus has got the keys. Revelation chapter 20, the first few verses say what's going to happen. He's going to get caught and chained and locked up for a thousand years. He was trying to trap Jesus by death. He's going to have the same thing happen to him. And who's he going to get replaced with? Eliakim means whom God establishes, the king who God establishes. He's the son of Hilkiah. He means the Lord is my portion. God the Father is going to replace Satan as the God of this world. Satan's going to be taken down, captured, chained for a thousand years. A thousand years is the day of the Lord. A day is as a thousand years. A thousand years as a day. Um, 
I don't know how it works out literally, but we've had 6,000 literal years, six days of man up until now. And we're liable to have a thousand literal years of the government of Jesus Christ. And those he brings with him are going to rule and reign with him. Along with anyone who he finds faithful here upon the earth when he returns. I will clothe him with thy robe. In other words, Satan's authority. The authority and the gifting that Satan has, he's going to lose it all to Jesus Christ. And strengthen him with thy girdle. And girdle has to do with covenant. There, there has to have been some kind of a deal between God and Satan. And uh, just like in the case of Job, we've been living out the proof. And we have even been showing things about God that, according to Peter, some of the angels may not have known. And, and God's raised up people that don't have to be forced to love him, that love him because of who he is, that are willing, just like he gave his life for us, according to John 3.16, mm -hmm. they're willing, like it says in 1 John 3.16, to lay down their lives for their brethren. And, and Jesus is our brother. He's the head of the many-membered body of Christ. And I will commit the, thy government into his hand. Satan's had the government of this world, this fallen world, and the world's going to come down, and Jesus is going to put his government, which isn't based on lies and doesn't lead to death. His government is based on truth, and it leads to life, his life. And he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Judah, house of Judah, those that praise the Lord, inhabitants of Jerusalem. It's supposed to be the city of peace, but it still uh, needs some major correction. Look at it. Full of religious factions, political factions, economic factions. But it's not going to remain that way. One of the titles of Jesus, according to Scripture, is the Eternal Father. Of course, Jesus' Father, God the Father, is also the Eternal Father. But Jesus... Is mature, which the father term has to do, and he produces excellent fruit in anyone that will allow him by the Holy Spirit to operate in their lives. And the key of the house of David I will lay upon his shoulder, so that he shall open and no one shall shut, and he shall shut and, and no one shall open. This is mentioned in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, in conjunction with the church of Philad at Philadelphia, which is the only church that received a totally good report. It's the church where they really fulfilled Jesus' commandment and truly loved one another. And we don't have time to study that church and that message, but um, it's right before the church of the Laodiceans, not even his church, their church, and he's outside knocking, and they're inside, and they've got everything you can think of except him. The key of the house of David goes along with the tabernacle of David, the throne of David that shall be established in mercy. Remember, when Moab goes down, and the Moabites are being, the, the, the ones that are dangerous are being cut off, and, and the ones that have been trapped in this are fleeing, and we're ordered to help them. And then it says that in the tabernacle of David, his throne is going to be established in mercy. In mercy. Well, the key of David goes along with the tabernacle of David. In other words, Jesus is going to make it so anybody can have a personal, direct relationship with him, and anyone that's clean can actually come into his presence if They've let him clean them up, and um, he's willing to show mercy, but he can't show mercy unless he establishes his truth. And so in order for us to receive mercy from God, he has to apply the truth and show us actually what we are and what the fruit of our own lives is and bring us to repentance. That requires grace. 
in order to be able to show mercy. And now, in this horrible thing of, of whoever's left out there trying to run around and do the church when the, when the church age is over, um, Jesus has got the key of the house of David. And the house of David can include us if we're totally surrendered to God. If you want a 10% commitment, well, I wish you the best. And some don't even want a 10% commitment. They don't even tithe. The house of David isn't the sin for saint commitment. The house of David is a total commitment. And the house of David, of those that are totally committed to God, also receive the sure mercies of David. Because if they slip, if they fall, if they make a mistake, if something goes wrong, God doesn't just cut them off. He intervenes. And yes, it'll be painful, but he takes whatever is wrong and cuts it right out of our hearts so that it won't cause a problem again. That's what he did with King David. And he made David's house to be a sure house, an eternal house. And the one that makes this all happen is the Lord Jesus Christ, who is, according to the gospel, of the house of David. And the key of the house of David, I will lay upon his shoulders. Who is this talking? This is God the Father talking. And it's on his shoulder, the shoulder symbol of government in the scripture. The government shall be upon his shoulder. So he shall open and no one shall shut. And he shall shut and no one shall open. What's he going to open? What's he going to open? The life of Christ to flow like never before in fullness through his people. What's he going to shut? The life of Adam. No more carnal people in the life of Adam pretending to represent him and, and not only messing up their own lives, but giving God a horrible reputation everywhere. That's all going to end. Plus, what's bound on earth will be bound in heaven, and what's loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. So this key is really important. And, and God's not going to let anyone fool with this key. This key belongs to Jesus, and um, if we're going to reign with him, if we're going to be involved in any type of judgment with him, uh, our hearts have to be clean. He's, he's, he's not going to give power and authority to reign to anybody who's not clean and who hasn't demonstrated under pressure the quality of their faith. And I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place, and he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. In other words, Jesus is going to be placed into a secure kingdom that will never end and that will never be corrupted, according to the book of Daniel and other scriptures. And they shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house, the sons and the grandsons, all the vessels of small quantity, from cups to drink from, even unto all the instruments of music. These cups, these vessels, are, are people. They're ministers of God and of Jesus, and even instruments of music. You remember when Babylon went down? Remember what they were doing? They had a thousand princes, and they brought out the vessels of the temple of God that they captured and were over there captured in Babylon, and they were all drinking Babylonian wine of the life of Adam, seeing who could drink the most and still say conscious. And they're sitting there drinking when all of a sudden a hand appeared and wrote on the wall in God's language, but no one understood God's language, so they had to bring Daniel. And it, it didn't just write on the wall. The original Hebrew says sculpted. In other words, this, this literally sculpted this into the stone wall, which was probably marble. This, this shook the palace to its foundations. The The... The uh, king stood up half soused and that says naked and sent for Daniel. And, and the interpretation was, you've been weighed in the balance and you've been found wanting. And, and this is it. This is the end of your kingdom. And so he was busy making, giving honors to Daniel. It didn't make any difference. That night his kingdom fell 
the river that flowed under the wall of Babylon was diverted by the army of the Medes and the Persians. There was a new government. And Cyrus decreed the order to rebuild Jerusalem. Persia means the eternal realm. Media means the middle of the earth. And the two came together to defeat Babylon. In media, just like it spoke in the beginning of Isaiah 21, uh, Elam is kind of a um, difficult to understand because the silent realm of Elam isn't just God. It's, it's the devil coming out of it. And this whole fight that's going on in heaven and the devil gets dislodged, this ends on the earth. It kind of got symbolized in the book of Esther where uh, even there you have um, Daniel who had been faithful prior to this and now where's Daniel? We don't know. He's off the scene, but he had victory in the lion's den. Jesus had victory over death. And um, if we have faith, we can share in his victory. But um, at the time of Esther, the devil had gotten in there and influenced the king to such an extent that there was going to be a day when they were going to rise up and kill all of God's people in all of the 120 some provinces, all on the same day, on the same, at the same time. And it looked like all God's people were going to get wiped out. But um, God turned the tables by using Esther because she was also in the secret realm. She didn't reveal herself for who she was. And when she was revealed, that was the end of Haman. And he got killed on his own um, gallows. And before he died, uh, previous leading up to this, he had to put um, Mordecai and the king's mule dress him as the king, put the king's crown on his head, and march him all around town saying, this is what you do to the person the king wants to honor. This is all types and shadows of what's going to happen in the end. The devil's going to lose his robe. He's going to lose his girdle. He's going to lose his position. He's going to lose everything. It's all going to go to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's going to go down on his own gallows along with his own people. And what he was trying to do, he's still trying to kill all God's people. He's still trying to kill every Jew and every Christian because he doesn't want God's promises to come through. And it's it's going to get dicey. It's, it's, it's going to be a time of anguish like we've never seen before. But God is going to intervene and turn the tables. That's what's going to happen, folks. And Jesus is going to be fastened as a nail in a sure place. And he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. In fact, when this all comes to a head in Revelation 6, towards the end of the chapter, the heavens are rolled away like a scroll in the Father's throne, in the Lamb, are revealed. And everyone, all the dwellers of the earth, run and flee and hide under the rocks and in the caves. But friends, if you have heavenly citizenship, if you're registered in the heavens, if you totally belong to Jesus, if the heavenly Jerusalem, that's the mother of us all, if you've been born again from above, you don't have to worry about any of this because the place of safety isn't a physical place. It's a spiritual place in God. The psalmist said 10,000 can fly. A thousand can buy you, fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. We can be right in the middle of all this and um, be the last one standing. Victorious. Jesus is coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. For a victorious church. Verse 25, in that day, saith the Lord of the hosts, the nail that is fastened in the sure place shall be removed and be cut down and fall, and the burden that was upon it shall be cut off, for the Lord has spoken it. What's the nail that's been up until now in the sure place? Satan and his government. It's all going to come down. And this is a burden that's been hanging there that God has been wanting to deal with for a long time, and that's been uh, a burden to all of God's people. All of God's people that are alive today and all of God's people that are coming back with Jesus. And so um, this burden that was upon it shall be cut off, for the Lord has spoken it. 
Heavenly Father, we ask that we might really understand this message and that we might um, not fool around and, and not be found still in the wilderness, still trying to do the things of the past, still trying to play church when it's time for the kingdom, when it's time for the last battle. We ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.